Oh, okay. Hey everyone, um, this is Control Shift's live stream of two studio vid visits today. Um, we're going to visit first Sophia Schultz Rocha. Is that how you pronounce her name? Okay. Um, their studio. And then after that, we'll be visiting at Kristen Grummer studio. Um, so, Sophia, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Cool. So I'm going to be talking about my studio practice um, and kind of the different parts of mediums that I use and kind of how they relate, but also how they're very different in the ways that they tell a story. Um, so I mainly use photography, filmmaking, and recently more sculpture um, as my mediums. Um, I'm really interested in exploring healing um, as well as trauma um, and kind of memory in different sorts of ways. So individual memory, collective memory, um, intergenerational memory, familial memory, um, and how those reside within objects, within people, within places, landscapes, environments. Um, kind of how we bring out those memories, how we heal them um, for both the future and the present. Um, yeah. So I first started off my art practice um, mainly in photography as like a young teen taking a lot of photos, mainly of my life, like of friends. Um, I grew up in Florida in a small town called Sarasota, it's right by the beach. It's really beautiful, but there's really not much for teens. Um, so I just take photos of my friends wandering around in the woods or at the beach um, or like in parking lots. Um, and from that, I got really interested in the idea of the subjects. I feel like I was always stuck in the past, always of past memories, um, whether it was like years ago or like a week ago. Um, so photography helped me kind of understand why I was so attached to the past and kind of work through things, um, but also as a form of documentation, which I feel like is really important um, in telling stories. And so I started off the film photography um, and then I kind of moved into doing more video works, which are definitely more experimental in the ways that I tell stories. Um, most of them, I just use friends, um, people that are not actors. Um, exploring a lot of different themes um, about like deviancy um, or sexuality or gender, um, friendship, love, um, being a killer teen. Um, it's very, very, um, but I definitely like to use humor, kind of irony in my films um, to get at really deep emotions. Um, yeah. And then what I work on mainly in my studio is sculpture or editing photos or editing videos. It's easier to show sculptures. Um, I started getting into sculptures probably about three years ago. Um, I'm a self-taught artist. Um, I went to school for anthropology, which I think also really informs my work um, in a different way. The sculpture is a really exciting thing for me to be able to take my ideas and make them physical. Um, so I really like really interactive um, engulfing installations or works that really draw you in. Um, yeah, so behind me <laughs> I have um, a more recent piece. I had it in the Control Shift group show um, last month. It's called Sana Kasana based off of a nursery rhyme that my mom would always tell me when I was a kid. Um, it's really silly nursery rhyme. It, like it's pretty much about if you have a stomach ache or something. It's talking about healing, but then it's talking about frogs. Um, it's kind of it's just a really silly nursery. Um, yeah. So for these sculptures, I use cyanotype chemicals. So it's like an alternative photo technique um, that. I think it's really beautiful in the way that um, it can go onto any porous um, material and it uses the sun to um, 
kind of imprint the image, kind of like when you're screen printing. Um, and so I would do it on fabric or wood or paper, um, and then either wheat paste or so, or like construct something from like the cyanotype chemicals that a cyanotype um, painted objects that had these photos on it. Um, so for the Sana Kasana piece, I used photos that, um, they're self-portraits that my mom took, as well as family photos. Um, I'm really inspired by the idea that, um, or like the reason why I'm using family photos, um, kind of how I feel like I'm continuing the work that my mom had done in her art practice when she was in her 20s. Um, she took a lot of like, experimental self-portraits and she'd make her own paper. Um, and she had a dark room process. And a couple of years ago, I found all of her negatives, um, and as well as some negatives that she used to work with, our family photos. Um, I have one. Do a thing. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is one of the family photos that she actually printed. Um, and my grandfather is one of the people in there, but I never met him. He passed away before I was born, so I can't, I don't know which one he is. Um, but it's photos like that that, I've, that I found a couple of years ago, and I just reuse really carefully, like working with this family archive um, to use for the cyanotypes. Um, so yeah. Self-portraits that my mom's taken, family photos, um, are what I use to make this piece, as well as um, I hand sewed it with my hair um, to kind of add, um, like directly add my DNA into it. I was really interested in the idea of like, you put so much work into these pieces, um, into sculptures, into your art practice. Um, and kind of having another element of the artist in the piece. Um, so you can only tell it's like a small detail when you go up close and you see all like these little hairs poking out. Um, also kind of gives it the sense that it's like alive, um, which I really liked since what I was saying before, that a lot of my work is about intergenerational trauma and healing um, and kind of using photos as like a mirror in a window. Um, so a mirror like reflecting back onto yourself and um, a window like looking into the past and the future and the present. Um, yeah. And I guess more about um, the cyanotype process. Um, I first started off doing smaller photos, kind of like a collage. Um, but then I moved into blowing them up to create like one larger image. Um, I've been more interested lately in creating like one single larger image rather than a collage type. Um, yeah. Um, and then over here, I have a couple of photos that are part of a collaborative photo series um, that I worked on before I moved from Florida. So I worked on it under 2017. Um, and I think a really great thing about photography and why I'm interested in continuing it with my practice is the collaborative aspect of it. Um, just being able to work with different artists, different people, um, and being able to share like, the storytelling process is really beautiful. Um, so there's two photos behind me. Um, that one is of Alexis, and the other one is of Carolina. Um, they both um, are friends based in Florida. And for the series, I photographed all women and non-binary people of color in um, Sarasota, Florida, which I feel like was really specific um, 
to the piece because the, the city itself is a very white, affluent city. Um, it's like a spring break destination. It's where like everyone's grandparents go to retire. Um, so sometimes it can feel like not a home. Um, and so with these photo series, I wanted to have these people um, interacting back with the land, um, which I feel like is really unique along the Gulf of Mexico. And they kind of create their own narratives um, of power, of healing, um, and like what it means to be like a person of color alone in nature. Um, so my friend that I collaborated with them, um, Sarah Viviana Valdez, she made like, most of the clothes and um, some of the objects of what Carolina is sitting on. Um, and she used use us all, or not all, but a lot of the pieces that she would add are made out of like scoby bacteria or hemp. So I liked how it added another element of like going back into nature. Yeah, so it's like an on, kind of an ongoing series. I'd like to continue it um, in California as well. Um, but its home is definitely in Florida. Um, yeah, I feel like next things that I'm working on in my studio is I'm experimenting with uh, using honey. Um, I was reading about how honey can be used as like a preservative, um, and it used to be as a preserve used as a preservative um, after a person has died. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, and along the lines of my work of um, preserving memory um, and honoring memory, um, I started working with honey and photos. Um, the very behind the scenes. Um, so these photos have been sitting with the honey for about um, two and a half months now. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but they're starting to crystallize. And I just love that it's like a time-based piece now that is always changing. Um, these are self-portraits that I took here in my studio. It goes this way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the portraits I took here in my studio, um, they were just really self-reflective self-portraits. Um, I was thinking a lot about what it means to like hold in emotions um, and hold in um, trauma and you know, just um, really inspired by what other people also in the collective are doing. The color yellow, um, I mean, that's a golden chair. Um, so yeah, I wanted to explore um, the color yellow with um, the feeling. Yeah, yeah we have a couple people in the, la in the physical audience. Um, <laughs> anyone has any questions? I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about the work that's on the, uh, the chair. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, these pieces, um, the summer, or not the summer, but the summer before, I was um, working at Elsewhere Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and during my time there, I, we had a garden on um, the back and me and another person working there, we were really interested, um, started doing a lot of natural dyeing using like food scraps um, or things that were in the garden. There was about like 10 people living there. So I feel like there's, it was always revolved around food and cooking. Um, and so I decided to start doing natural dyeing and create a quilt. Um, so these two, there are two quilts um, that I sew, both the, both the cyanotype process and um, natural hand-dyed pigments. Um, and when they were up at Elsewhere Museum, it was in the library. Um, and there were two on each 
they're one on each side facing each other and in the middle um, there was a video piece um, and the piece was called um, Once I Dreamt the Moon Exploded. It was all about, um, it was just kind of analyzing my dreams while I was there. Um, and I kept having dreams about the moon being for like either like multiple moons or yeah, the moon exploding. Um, so I started to like kind of recreate those dreams in the museum and also um, just like with editing by myself and kind of like redoing the dreams as a way of like processing what it what they meant. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about the relationship of your photographs and sculpture? Sculptural works um, in the past few weeks, photographs a lot on sculpture. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, so I don't have really any of the, I guess this is kind of an example. Yeah, I'm gonna move the camera. Yeah, to it. Um, so this is a very little. This is one example of um, kind of taking the photos into a more sculptural element. Um, but I feel like I was first interested in using photos for sculptures um, just as a way to create an environment. Um, and Yeah, I feel like it just seemed like, like that putting photos and sculptures together is kind of another form of image making, um, like separate from filmmaking. Um, but I think it's another way to have the photo go beyond like a wall, um, kind of become more tactile. Um, I think it's really interesting, like what would you put like a photo on what type of material so in the past I would do it with wood um so I made like this kind of like home type thing it was pretty big and you could go inside of it um and then there's there were some cyanotype um images on the walls in it um but like really sparingly and yeah I feel like it's just another way to tell the story <laughs> Um, I guess I can talk about what else I hope to be working on. Um, so apart from the studio practice, um, I also make films I kind of mentioned and I'm like constantly working on a couple different screenplays to do more like narrative form short films um, and eventually feature length like, films. Um, but I feel like with my photo work is a good example also of my film making work. Um, like I said, I was really, I'm really interested in the collaborative aspect of them and like specifically working with and like uplifting um, people of color and queer groups. Um, and so, yeah, just working together um, to tell different stories that I think are not portrayed um, in film. Um, I guess I'm curious if you want to tell us a little bit about um, how your practice has changed over time. You told us a little bit about like what you're going to be working on or what you're working on right now, some things that you'd like to do that you're super proud of with you. Yeah. Also, I want to change this just a little yeah. bit. Yeah. There. Oh, let's see if I can get this sculpture in there it's too. Okay. okay. <laughs> go back to the original there. Um, there we go. Yeah, I feel like having a studio practice is still really new to me. Um, 
I joined Control Shift in June, and that was the first, this is my first studio that I've ever had. Um, and so I feel like prior to this, I just like make things in my backyard or like in my room, um, or just using like the outdoors as like my studio um, with like photo and filmmaking. So I think having like a dedicated space has been really great, but also really challenging at times. Um, just kind of dedicating time on um, kind of sticking with the, um, with the project and it's still something that I'm constantly working on and like evolving with. Um, but yeah, I think my, my studio practice changes with like the season or if I'm really busy. Um, and I feel like it's been a good place for where just at least holding ideas that like are up on the walls or in notebooks. Um, and just having other people around to talk to or share ideas or see what they're working on. Um, it's been really inspiring to what I want to see with my own practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could, I could keep asking questions, but um, <laughs> I know that we, uh, well, we have a little bit more time. Do you mind? I have like two more yeah, and then we can um, maybe switch it up. Um, I guess I'm curious. That's a really big one. So <laughs> um, answer, take what you like, leave the rest, like whatever works for you. But I'm curious why art? Like, why do you make art? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I was question a lot <laughs> for myself mm -hmm. in a good way and maybe not so good way. <laughs> um, but I think it just goes back to being able to tell stories through it, um, whether it's my own or my family's or my communities, um, my friends, people around me. I think it's a really beautiful way of conveying emotions, um, ideas, and I think larger than that, um, the art community is a really good place to find friendship and solidarity. Um, and I think there's a lot of power of like, artists coming together, like working towards um, like common goals, um, Kind of like control shift. Um, yeah. And then there's another part of it that, um, on a personal level, I create work to like process my own um, emotions and past. Um, and I think it's been really good for that as like an emotional outlet. Um, I think it also pushes me like a little bit outside of my comfort zone sometimes, um, which I think is really good. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my last one is, um, I think I've read and heard you talk about this a little bit about being self-taught. And I just wanted to hear you talk about what it's like to come to photography and teach yourself all these skills and, um, yeah, what you, yeah, just like your your experience um, being a self taught artist. Yeah, um, I think there's value to it. Of course, like I think I, <laughs> I think I'm an artist, <laughs> um, but I think it can also be challenging. Um, just uh, like the resources and the knowledge. Um, and I feel like in the art world, it is really common nowadays for like everyone to have gone to at least undergrad for art. But a lot of people have gotten their masters um, in fine arts. But at the same time, I feel like being a self-taught artist is kind of like destroying the concepts a little bit of that 
you're only a valuable artist or a valued artist um, if you went to school for it or if you have like gallery representation over these things. Um, so I like it in that sense that I feel like I can come from a different background um, and have a different perspective on the art world. Um, yeah, I just felt like that my voice is still starts to be recognized within the art community. Um, I think, yeah, especially, especially with photography, I think it was, I just, I don't think it was really hard to, or like I can't like recall it being like, oh, this is so difficult. It was just like, like art is like a constantly thing that you're learning, um, you're constantly learning new skills. Um, and I feel like not being constricted by like, um, by like a, a prompt or anything helped me, yeah, just kind of create whatever I wanted to create. Um, yeah, I watch a lot of YouTube videos and I ask a lot of questions to my friends that are knowledgeable. Um, or like, I have a friend and he's an editor. Um, so whenever he's editing anything that we work into, I'm just like staring, being like, okay, what does that button do? Okay, okay, I think I got it. Uh, so just, yeah, I think just pulling resources from the people that I know has been really helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna step over here and share that we're gonna transition to Kristen's studio. So we're gonna um, cover the uh, camera for a minute while we move over there. So stay tuned. Thanks for bearing with us as yeah. we sort out the technical difficulties. Yes, yes, thanks for your patience. Hi, uh, my name is Kirsten Bramer, and um, I'm an artist here at Control Shift uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, originally, I grew up in Colorado, a very small mountain town in northwest corner called Cedar Springs. Um, I think that I generally introduce that because first, because a lot of my work 
derives from um, growing up in such a small place and having a home away from my parents. Um, I also get really nervous uh, speaking to people, so I have my notes here, so if you can see me glancing down, that, that would be why. Um, yeah, so I guess I can talk a little bit about um, how I came to art in the first place. I went to like a liberal arts school in Oregon, and there I had a really great mentor, um, Alexander Oakley, and I ended up falling in love with um, just the darkroom and darkroom process and darkroom photography. Everything about it is really, really exciting and to me, and I think that. Honestly, I think that it's like the closest thing to magic we could get to. And now uh, I teach darkroom photography at um, Calvary College of Arts, which is really has been an awesome opportunity. And sometimes I feel like I'm cheating because it's like you get to introduce all these kids to like this magic and you get to like put the paper in this chemical and then like the image appears and it's just they're all so excited and amazed by it. I think especially because um, digital photography and things have made um, images so accessible. Um, so that's been a really awesome opportunity. Um, yeah, and then so from that, um, I've also always really loved women and other people, and I think that like people fascinate me. And I think thinking about that idea that you have so many layered experiences and thoughts and everything that you have been through makes up your um, idea of the world and then thinking about how complex that is and then thinking about other people as well um, and how each person is as complex as you are within their perspective and I think it just um, I think it's a really beautiful thing and so I photographed a lot during that time with a lot of bodies of work around the way that we intrinsically mimic each other um, when we have relationships with each other. So it's like um, whether you're walking in step or like leaning towards someone, um, I think this idea of proximity and touch has really traveled throughout my entire practice um, through like all stages. Um, and so noticing when like people are close to each other and I'm old, always been like very like romantically geared of like oh are they dating <laughs> or like what's happening like what is happening with other people like I just ask a billion questions <laughs> you know me. but um yeah and so it started that and then I moved to photographing houses and so I started photographing houses as these portraits of people that lived inside them um and really looking to like the ventures and the different photographers that focused in um, photographing structures um, and structures in a way that's very like typological that just um, kind of is comparing or like they're all laid out next to each other and so you have a lot of pictures of um, just like a house made the same way but like when you put them next to each other they become very individualized and I think um, I became very fascinated with this idea of the kit home which in the I think it was like the 1930s through the 1950s really you would get these catalogs that you could essentially order a home by railway um, to like the state that you lived in and they would deliver your home and you would build it and there are so many catalogs depicting these homes and it's really fascinating and so thinking a lot about like these craftsman style homes that really drew me um, and the ways that people would build these homes but then they would alter them so that they would be original so you'd see two houses like right next to each other that were built from the same catalog but that had all these touches that really like um, embody who they are or showed all these different variances and like the lives that have lived there um, and so that was really interesting to me I know I'm talking about work that I've done here but um yeah and so then I have always carried this love of people and this like idea of proximity um, and so later on I started um, kind of uh, separating two and looking more inward and thinking a lot about um, my own place in the universe as like um, 
like a white queer woman uh, in the world and then really examining like the ideas of gendered socialization that comes with that and is like passed down through lineages to affect me um, and how um, I was raised to like take up a particular amount of space or already always think about like the space I was taking up and I think this ties a lot into in my mind of like the also the visual sense of like physical proximity between people but really it, it is as well like auditorily emotionally um, and physically so I've been thinking a lot a lot about these things and so um, you can see behind me and this is like uh, a gelatin silver print which is just a print that's made in the dark room with one focus oh. mm -hmm. I can continue that seems to be weird away from the glare can I turn it down oh yeah that? that's great yeah yeah um and so coming up all of these ideas and then thinking a lot about um again the home and like these sites in the home that are rooted in intimacy and um the body and thinking about i'm really interested also in like furniture and love seats in particular i think it's like fascinating to me that a piece of furniture is built to house two bodies um and it like becomes such a site of intimacy if you think of your home like your couch in your home and how much um like interaction or how many things like that couch has seen you know <laughs> like all of the range of your life that couch is there looks like um, with you and so then thinking about um the ways that these like sites become part of you and part of your perspective but also part of how you fit into the world and so um, taking these self portraits with this furniture and kind of exploring becoming part of this furniture and um, different ways of interacting with the furniture it's like a body of work that i've just been working on over the last year or so um, and No, it, it's not in the like I think I really like the frame, but this is also going to. So this is also, this one is me. <laughs> 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 um, oh, yeah. Oh, a little better. Um, but this is just a color version of that. And so this is like just a large digital print. Um, I prefer to work in film, but I think sometimes you don't have access to equipment or things that you'd like to, so um, you make do with what you can find. But um, yeah, so that is something that I've been working on lately. I think another very like large body of work that I think I'm approaching is combining all of these things, and I didn't really realize this until recently, um, but thinking a lot about, so the space you take up, um, and also about this like proximity between people, but also bringing that into my relationship to the land and um, the like, natural land and the landscape, and so thinking a lot about this like proximity and closeness and the physical space that my body takes up in the land and then wondering if I can eventually like devise a system that of like physical proximity to the land that mimics like um, proximity or closeness within like intimacy or um, also like scale to the world and this is all just like uh, there's like a lot of ideas floating up in here so um but it's a lot of it is not fully like flushed out or anything so it's very much works in progress um but you just then that like um uh, it's a little bit of this series over here which is using my body to show scale in the landscape but also using 
um, things like measuring tapes or this idea that like string can show different proximity um, and like the way that my scale is similar to this stump. And I think that this also, I think a lot about the history and lineage of photography within my practice. And I think that um, you'll see all of these very, very old photographs that are taken um, when photography was really like a very new form of documentation. And so it was used, um, a lot of people would go to different parts of the world and take photographs um, there and then have people stand with these monuments. Like there's a lot in um, like Egypt and different places that are um, just have like people like spread like like these monuments and then there's like little people that are just standing around in like different places because they wanted you to see that this is huge. It's not just like a small image because people weren't also like weren't um, used to seeing images in that way before. And so if you showed an image, people would have no idea of like the scale of that. And so then they would have these people like spread out throughout and so thinking a lot about um, the ways in which scale works that way and the ways in which um, we are so small in nature and um, kind of comparing that. Yeah, I think that's what I've been working on now. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And yeah, or like, could you talk more about your show that's opening up next week? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a show opening next week, um, to do a show with another artist um, named Dion Lee, and it's at Control Shift in our gallery, which is really, uh, quite amazing, and I feel really excited to show here, um, and these actually are, like, prints, um, large, large prints of these, I'm, like, very excited that I don't did this large yet. Um, they're like 40 by 50 inches. But, um, and so our show is really focusing on the ways in which we identify um, with our like bodies in, um, in accordance to the natural landscape. Um, we both have like very different histories. Um, so me being like a white queer woman and Dion um, is a black woman. Um, from New York, and so our relationships to nature are like polar opposite, <laughs> um, and so, um, and the connotations of us being in nature are also very, very different, and so something I'm excited about this show is that and not only have we collaborated on some videos um, dealing with proximity and scale and um, these relationships and these variances, but we've also are creating like a reading and research room, which is very exciting, which is featuring a few um, artists based in the Bay that will have work. And then we also will have um, a library with um, full of a bunch of like, different books um, about nature and the body. Um, and we're going to have programming as well with that. So we'll have like open reading hours. Um, we're going to have an herbalist come in and teach a workshop. So these also these opportunities for like the community to be able to take part within the exhibition and within an art space um, without necessarily the pressure of just it being like being within a white walled space, um, kind of breaking that a little bit and having interaction also play a part. Um, yeah. When does it open? Oh, it opens on April 5th, if you would like to come by. <laughs> we will welcome you, there will be drinks, <laughs> and great art and great people, so. Cool. Um, I have a question about the work that's over here. Can we mm -hmm. pivot and talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this artwork on the wall, so these are collages made from found photos, and each one of these is, um, I like envision as a small like horizon or um, small like piece of land. And um, I really imagine them as a wallpaper. And this is why they're displayed like this, because I think in my, in my dream, 
this I imagine that it's filling an entire room. Um, and these are very much in progress, and I'm not quite sure where they are going or what I want to do with them. Um, I think that working a lot um, with photography and video, you are like, I specifically get very um, frustrated sometimes when you're constantly editing on the computer and going back to the computer. Um, and this is a way also for me to kind of exercise a physical act of like making, um, because I think that that's important to me as well. I'm thinking a lot about like how Sophia answered the question earlier about um, kind of why they make art. And a lot of mine has to do with process and processing things. Um, and so making images and working in this way really allows me to, I think, evaluate and process and question the world that we live in and question the world that um, like the future world that we could live in and like all these different things um, and really just like explore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there other things that you are like are working on? Maybe you told us a little about the show that's coming up. I guess I'm curious yeah. about what other things you're working on currently, or if it's been like everything's been focused on that. Or... Yeah, um, I work on a lot of different things at once. I think that there are a lot of things that um, take their like, I always like in photography, I feel like there are some bodies of work that take a lifetime and just kind of keep building on each other. And I think that, um, I mean, I think this goes for all art in general, but, um, I feel like I'm working on a couple different things. Um, so a particular series, I'm making a video um, about sunsets. And mm -hmm. so there's this place on top of Grizzly Peak that has become really, really important to me. And I think um, I used to go there a lot to process and to kind of um, when I needed a break or when I needed to escape or when I wanted to show someone a beautiful view or when I wanted um, help with like a day. Like I was just like, I'm having a day, I need somewhere to be. And so it kind of resulted in this ritual of going to the same spot very often to watch the sunset. And so while I was up there, I started videoing it. And so then it became this ritual that um, I just very much looked forward to. I think that I went through kind of a rough summer and a lot of things happened and shifted in my life. And it, this place became so important to me. And I think that's also something that runs through the rest of my work is that this idea of place versus space. Um, there are a lot of theories on it within like geographers have about how we create place from experience within space. And so this idea that this place became so important to me. And so I would start noticing things like slowly, I started to notice like, okay, like the moon is full tonight or, and it's like rising in a certain spot or like watching the sunset, you would say like, oh, it's like, you could see it moving like across the mountains when it would set. And the rise became such an important like point of placement for myself in the world of saying like, so the sun is rising here and I know what like time of the year it is and I think that that coming outside of myself and outside of even just like our technology I think instead of like looking at Google and being okay like what time does this happen or like <laughs> what's the weather going to be like actually being there and like watching it um and so I yeah I started videoing it I'm working on a video series about it I went like almost every day during the summer. And then I've been going to the same place for like two years. And so I just have all of this footage of these different moments of the sunset from the different place or from the same place, right? Um, yeah, and so I've been working a lot with that footage, which is very frustrating sometimes because I think when you have all of this and you're like, it's going to be something. And then you're like, I don't know quite what it is yet. And so you just have to kind of like sit with it. 
and let it like soak and just be like, okay, I have this and it's happening. Um, yeah, and so that is something that's really important to me. I think, I don't know, do we have, do we have another question we can talk about? But yeah, we have like 10 minutes and I have Holy more questions moly, for you. 10 minutes. It goes okay. by faster than you think. You've been great. <laughs> um, and then, so I guess another series I've been working on lately, it, um, It just takes time because I only ask people that I uh, have like come in contact with, but I think at some point I will open it up to like a wider audience, um, probably on the internet in some, in some time, so stay tuned. <laughs> but um, I'm working on an archive of tears, and I think that this ties back to really like thinking about um, lineages of socialization and how we deal with. I think that um, emotions are often overlooked or especially like emotional art or art about emotions becomes very dismissible. And I think that it's really important to um, validate that emotions are things that we all have and that they're really important to process through, they're important to recognize. And um, so I've been creating an archive of tears and I've been asking um, people, like underrepresented people, primarily like um, women identified or um, gender non-conforming trans individuals to um, cry into vials that I give them. Um, they're like these small vials um, that are used for actually, uh, perfume normally um, so that they will like stay forever um, sealed but and to write me a letter about why they cry um, and in exchange I write them a letter of why I cry and I think this exchange is very important I think that like this exchange of vulnerability and honesty and openness um, becomes like really really important in this work um, but this is also like a very slow going process um, of like kind of like lobbying and holding these um, different archives. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have questions about that one. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you have an idea of like, um, is this going to be like ongoing for foreseeable future? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, it's not like a set amount of people or yeah, a particular slice of time. I don't have a set amount of people or a particular slice of time. Yeah. I kind of just see it going indefinitely. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be a really great thing eventually to have um, people to submit to um, in some way or form. I haven't figured out logistics quite yet. I think that um, in the future I would like to apply for some grants to be able to um, fund postage and things for people so that I don't really like the idea of you have to make them pay to be a part of a project about um, emotional vulnerability. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I kind of see it going forever. Um, and I don't know, uh, I've like scanned in some things and made the work photographic in the way that I think it could become a book at some point. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the vials are also very, uh, I don't know, there's like something about the vials that you can see like, bits of mascara and um, I also encountered a problem when I first started it that they were actually quite like hard to cry into. I think that there's um, there's actually histories of people keeping tears of so the Victorian era people used to um, cry into tiny spoons and keep them in like necklaces and things like that um, to uh, process grief and mourning and some different things and so um, So, um, crying into uh, oh yes and so it became very hard and so I actually kind of made a, um, a like rule almost because it is kind of an instructional work as well um, and so that you can also substitute the tears for something 
else within the file um, that feels appropriate or suitable to you. Mm. And so I have one file that has a match in it. Um, mm. And I have a file that has melted snow in it. Um, so then like also you get to see, I think like different perspectives of how people move through the world and the way that they like relate to objects, which I think is very interesting as well. So the vials are quite beautiful as physical objects too. So. They sound like it. Yeah. I'd love to see them if that was okay with those people, you know. I don't yeah. know if that's part of it is like the whole like consenting yeah. to have that displayed or not. They definitely, or... I've gotten consent from everyone that's um, yeah. a part of it. Like I'm very, um, I think that like honesty is the best policy ever and really, really important. So every person that's ever like participated yeah. in anything of mine um, always gotten consent from them or like that they know that this will be something that's shared. Um, and if there was a point uh, that they didn't want it to be shared, I would maybe just like show the back of like their letter or something like that. And mm -hmm. they yeah. can still like write to me and not have it shared. Um, and it would be open if people wanted to participate and did not want to share um, the, the public. Yeah. Um, and where did that idea come from? Um, if you want to talk about it. I think this idea came from, it came through frustration in grad school. Mm -hmm. um, I think I am an individual that cries a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it, it was something that um, I kind of questioned, like, why I felt so, like, weak for crying. Um, and this idea that tears are not only for emotional reasons, although they are as well. There are actually three different types of tears. Um, they each have like different crystal structures, which is kind of cool. Um, ranging from like um, physical defense to actually like the tears that you cry for emotions are like an equalizer. So they're trying to like equal out your like um, thoughts. And so um, it's kind of like dispelling all of this um, negativity or like these um, like unequal emotions. So, um, yeah, I cry when I like get nervous, when, when I'm sad, when I'm like too happy, like all the time. And I just, I think that there's, um, such a stigma around it. And I think it started to frustrate me a lot because I think that we all cry <laughs> at one point or another. And it also blends into this kind of like, um, questioning the socialization of, um, your gender and these different things of like well, why why are we told to deal with emotions and tears in different ways and like why are some people expected to cry and some people not and like um I think also driving from yeah just like very um much like outdated ideas of like femininity and um softness and like these things that are associated the female body and with like females in general and I think that that um, is where it started for sure um, just like questioning all of these things and wanting to connect with people also to see like why other people are like this it's also like something that I think is a way to have like an intimate connection with someone and like a conversation about these things um, and I think that it's really important to take these things seriously and I think that they're completely valid um, and they should be talked about and we should talk about it more. So, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you want us to know about your practice before we wrap up? I don't yeah. think so. Okay. If you come to the show, then we will meet and I'll talk to you more <laughs> about my practice in person and then I can see your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in for our uh, live stream studio visits and stay tuned for the next set. Those will be probably in a couple of months. So thank you again and see you soon. <laughs>